So here are here's some examples of some interactions. So this is a, um, a river otter, in this case in Louisiana, from our Louisiana stuff, uh, eating a blue crab, munching a blue crab. Um, and it's important before we go on to some other things that I just need to make sure that you guys understand because I sometimes, you know, I don't, I don't typically work on microbes. I work on microbes when they're like pollution and stuff, but, but um, I don't typically work on them. But we do have all these other cool members that we shouldn't be speciesists or sizeists or whatever and, and ignore them. So we have a lot of cool things. Uh, I would just highlight the algae, the reds. Uh, greens and browns. So these these are anything from small critters like diatoms all the way up to things like macrocystis and giant and giant kelp and things like that. Uh, then we have our archaea and our bacteria. Most important of the archaea would be the methanogens, the things that can eat methane. Methane is going to come from that anoxic environment, the degradation of carbon tissues in this anoxic environment. So the methanogens are really important players here. And the bacteria with the most important of those, I would, I think for us, would be the cyanobacteria, those photosynthesizing guys, especially in those really salty areas around the uh, tidal uh, salt pans and stuff like that. And then fungi. So fungi have typically been ignored in salt marshes because they're not as abundant as they are in some places, but it seems to be that that's mostly because we haven't looked too heavily at them. There are, uh, mycorrhizae, which are the fungal organisms that have an intimate relationship with plants. We most typically think about those with legumes and nitrogen-fixing bacteria and stuff. Um, but, but mycorrhizae are, can be a key part of restoration. So, one of the, so the best predictor as to whether when we put in um, native grass seeds in a, in a grassland restoration, coastal grassland we're trying to restore, one of the best predictors as to whether those plants are going to germinate and do okay, the natives, um, are the, is the tilling history of that place. So if it's been farmed, they tend to not do well. If it hasn't been farmed, if it's just been sort of hayed and, and, and just weeds grown on it, that tends to be okay. But if the, farmers have got, if, if the landowner has gone in and tilled the soil and, and changed the soil structure, that tends to be a lot harder to get guys to grow. The best thing to do is to inoculate the soil with mycorrhizae. With, with sort of, again, trying to jumpstart what would normally happen over the long time, but trying to push forward in that successional pathway. Um, and so, yeah, so those are all players. Okay, wow, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you guys a handout on this. Um, so don't, you don't have to copy these down, but I just wanted to uh, go over these real quick, and then I want to show you what some of these guys look like, okay? Because you guys need to see these things. So again, I will, I'll post this for you guys. I'll give you guys a PDF of this, or maybe I'll give you an Excel form. I, I can't remember which form I have it in, but I'll give it to you. Um, so these would be for degraded places, right? These are degraded places. So you should jot down at least a couple of these, right? So this is degraded. So degraded marsh would be something like our invasive Spartina, something like and again, this is for our salt marshes. So make sure you're noting this is salt marsh, not general wetland, but salt marsh. And then a typha. Typha, huge asterisk here. So typha is, so I, I can't tell typha species. I just call them spa. They make this huge, they hybridize like nobody's business. These are the big cattails we see in all, everywhere around. <coughs> there are probably some non-natives there. Most of them are natives, but they hybridize like nobody's business and they do really well in disturbance. So it's really hard to tell what's going on. If we have typha, that in and of itself does not say that something is bad. However, from our perspective of a salt marsh, usually when we have a lot of typha, that means the hydrology is wrong. That means that the water is too still and it's, there's too little disturbance and these guys have come in. Another classic indicator of disturbance and, and problems would be Arundo, our invasive giant reed, huge problem. And all of our watersheds, pretty much now all of our watersheds, at least in the coastal west, increasingly across the west. Midmarsh, something like brass buttons, cotula, 
which would be something we'd more typically see in the upland area. So if we have this, this is more of a signal that we, we have um, some problems going on. Uh, Vicia is a non-native vetch. Okay, then we're starting to get, with these other things we're starting to get into, these things are, note, from pretty much from here on out, let's see, what have I listed here? Yeah, everything else on the rest of this list is non-native. Everything else is invasive. So this is a castor bean, right? So castor bean is all that stuff we see around the sides of our roads here. Super problem for us here in Southern California. Um, and again, what's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So the, the, the seeds are these prickly, like prickly mace-like seeds. Um, everybody freaks out about it, like, don't your kid buy it? Because uh, if you take the seeds and boil the seeds down and do some extraction, that's what you make ricin poison out of. <laughs> and so, yeah, so um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't feed it to a kid, but you know, you don't have to freak out. Um, and then things like fennel, things like our ice plants and all that kind of stuff, and that just continues on. So all, a lot of these things. So, if you're, so um, Rumix was one of the species that we saw last week up in uh, Ojai, the one he said that's characteristic of, of a wetter condition. But in our salt marshes, uh, most, they're not good. We don't want them in our salt marshes. Um, okay, so classic things that would be in the fresher reaches would be these things, scirpus, cyparis, all these sedges and bulrushes. And then our willows, our willows in the fresher reaches. So we have several species here. Um, most importantly for us would probably be narrow leaf willow. But, but there are several species. And then things like these rushes, these juncus, juncuses. So again, I'll, I'll give these to you guys. You don't have to copy them all down. I would, I'm mostly now focus on writing a couple down, representative ones, and, and making notes as opposed to writing all the words and stuff down. Okay, next is um, uh, what, are the, what are the community dominants? What are the things we most typically see that we most would expect to see in our restoration or hope to see in our restoration. So down low, if we're going to have any Spartina, it's going to be Spartina foliosa, the native Spartina. And maybe a little bit of Rupia. Maybe. But, but not much. Okay, then we start to get in what we would, you would typically think of as the main plane of the salt marsh. And so for that, we would have uh, Salicornia virginica. So write that down. And then put an asterisk by it, because we're going to talk about the name still. We haven't gotten there yet, but so salicornia, pickleweed. Uh, most important plant you should know, salicornia. Second most important plant you should know is frankinia. So frankinia is uh, really, really important. It's not as important as salicornia, but it's really close. Next, sueda. You pronounce that sueda, like, like I have a pair of sueda shoes. I mean, I don't, but you get what I'm saying. Blue sueda shoes. Um, uh, Battis and Jaumea. So you should know what the, all those look like. Uh, yeah, I'm going to we'll look at pictures in a second. Look at pictures in a second. And then next is going to be uh, the higher marsh. So the higher marsh is going to be more diverse. So some of these plants we see elsewhere in, in the upland, elsewhere, up on the terrestrial. I would say the one that's uh, most... Uh, couple that are most important, I would say, is limonium, sea lavender. People have this in, their, in a different species, but, but the same genus in their gardens sometimes. They have these really pretty purple flowers. The plant is very prostrate, but when it sets flowers, it has this huge long stem that it puts up that's very pretty. Uh, and then disticlus, of course, salt, salt grass. Disticlus is one of the rare, a rare salt marsh plants that is everywhere. You'll see disticlus up in the Sierras natively, you know, just on its own. Up in the Sierras, you'll see it in Idaho, you'll see it in the Central Valley, you'll see it all over. So the Sticklus is a real super awesome competitor. Um, but we most typically see it in the upper marsh zone. And then another, another uh, two I want to call out to you is um, Atriplex, which is a sh typically a shrub-like shrub -like, uh, critter. We have, we have, there, there are native and non-native versions, so some of these are invasive, but, but Atriplex in general. And then Menantha Chloe which is another, uh, not numerically abundant, but, but pretty commonly encountered 
Uh, all these guys are commonly countered, but I would I would flag those. So so you should have starred Spartina for the lower marsh, for the mid marsh, all five of those: Salicornia, Frankenia, Sueda, Battis, and Jaumea. And for the upper marsh, I would just tag Limonium, Atriplex, uh, Distichlis, and Mananthe Chloe. Okay, so let's let's look and see what these things uh, look like. Okay. Um, When we have big stands of these cord grasses, it can be actually hard to walk. So what we're looking at here on the lower left, this is Spartina foliosa. This would be the native. Um, it's actually, it it's, can be physically difficult to go from one side of it to the other because the, the stems, now the stems look abundant here. We're looking at, we're looking at the stems. This is, this is the time of the year where the plants have died back, right? And so we don't have a lot of above ground biomass, but there's a huge amount of root structure and, and subsurface biomass. But walking across these things is difficult. It's easy to fall down. And they, it actually sounds like you're walking through, um, like if you guys ever taken like a xylophone and, and run a, like, like with, you know, with the hammer or your fingers, it sounds like that. Because there's all these hollow stems. And as you step, it's like, <laughs> so it's kind of trippy. Um, and then, uh, and so, so so native stuff, and then the hybrid, we mentioned this before. So uh, just glancing at them, they'll be hard to tell, but if you know what you're looking at, you can tell the difference. We don't have any of the hybrid down here, thankfully, so it's hard to see. But up north, huge problem. So here's the hybrid looks like when we're down inside of it. So very, very dense. This would be a case of, uh, in this, in the, the hybrid, it forms a monoculture, right? So it, it excludes just about everybody else. And so it's, it's uh, it's a challenge for a lot of organisms. This is one of our monitoring sites up here. This is up in uh, northern San Francisco Bay. This is Salicornia is up here. So the, the you know, what we would call the mid marsh by the terminology I'm giving you. And then this used to be mud flat. This should be mud flat. It's not. It's all this invaders come on in. OK, here's Rupia. This is this, is this so-called ditch grass. And this is, you know, a, a basically looks like a floating plant looks grass-like. Um, and then here's, so okay, pickleweed. Got to know this. So here's my note. I've been telling you guys to asterisk salicornia. So um, names have been changing a lot. So I have a I have a bunch I have a I have big beefs with the molecular biology folks. I, I, we we tend to not party too well together. So um, so th they do great stuff, but one of the frustrating things is it's become so easy now to do you know genetic typing and to look at evolutionary relationships. Tons of folks spend their master's degree just going out and saying, hey, is all this thalicornia the same thalicornia? And they go and they grab thalicornia from, say, seven different marshes. And they, they you know, th PCR them, and they throw them in gene bank, and they go, ha, huh, check it out. This looks like it's actually two species. So therefore, uh, I'm going to say that they're actually not one species, two species. So they, 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 they change the name. And this happens all the time. And it's a real challenge for those of us that are doing applied stuff, trying to do monitoring. One of the snails I worked on for my PhD, which wasn't that long ago, like 15 years ago, has changed names four times in the, since you know, the last like 17 years, probably 18 years. That's messed up. We use Latin names because the Latin name is supposed to not be changing very frequently, right? <coughs> Common names. <coughs> Excuse me. Common names we typically look down upon, right? Like, oh, that's that's what the guys in Ventura call it, and then the guys up in Santa Barbara call it this, and the guys up in San Francisco call it that, right? Like, that's lame. In many cases, it's actually easier to use the common name because that one is is, is changes less frequently, which is crazy. That's crazy. So. So that, that happens a lot. So I will probably use, if we're walking around and doing stuff, the old name. Because it, 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 it's hard to keep up with how quickly they're changing. And I've gone down the route of constantly updating all of our 
all of our all of my slides or stuff, and then six months later it'll change again, and that and that defeats the perp the point in my opinion of a scientific name. So this is really a scientific. So the organizations that control scientific names, it's really up to them to do something about it. But it, it's it's becoming an issue. For you guys, if you guys go work in restoration, it's not going to be a huge issue. But if you if you do go work for an agency that does a lot of long term monitoring, it is a deal, right? Because you might have this database that has all these names in it, and then, you know, whatever, two years from now the name one of them changes. So then what do you do? I guess we go back and change all the names. Okay. A lot of work, right? And, and this is non-trivial. Most of the folks that do our long-term monitoring of restoration performance, stuff like that, they, they have almost no money, right? They don't have a large staff. So they don't have the ability to go in and reprogram everything all the time. But maybe they'll go do that to make the database updated. And then it changes again, and it's a huge problem. So for example, our friends that do the kelp forest monitoring project for the Channel Islands National Park, they pretty much just use the old names and they say, we just keep using the old names. And then when it comes to writing up the report, we might put the most current name in. But we, all the old species codes all use the old names because it's just, it's, it's just too crazy. You can't go back and update 20 years of data you know, just because these three change. And, 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 and then they will continue to change. So you guys get the point. Okay, so anyway, so the, my point is this species is now Salicornia pacifica. That is the official legal name. You'll hear me call it Salicornia virginica. In my previous slides, I've been calling it Salicornia virginica because that's what it used to be for years and years and years. So the, the lesson to you guys, when you guys are, if you're doing a senior capstone, if you guys are doing some research, whatever, you need to look up all of the possible names. You need to look up the name it was now, the name it was five years ago, the name it was 10 years ago, right? Because the, when, the, when, we put, when that paper was published 10 years ago, it's using the 10 year ago name, right? So it, it's, a, it's a logistical challenge, but it's what it is. So anyway, so I call this Salicornia virginica. But this is pickleweed. So classic thing, succulent stem. The lower parts of the stem will be more woody-like. That's Salicornia, pickleweed. This is what it looks like when it's, when it's you know, in a big, big monoculture, typical field, major, major player for us in our West Coast salt marshes. Salicornia. More salicornia. Look at that. Cool. Super, super in, in really nice wet areas. Do go into town. Okay. Number next, Frankenia. Here's Frankenia. This is uh, now. This guy is pretty robust stem. Could take a step on it, and if well, I'm, I'm I weigh more than most of you guys, but but if I took a step, I'd be bad. But most of you guys, if you stepped on it, it wouldn't be good, but it would be okay, right? This stuff, you step on it anybody steps on it, it's going to snap. It's a much more brittle stem, right? It's not robust. It's very, it looks like rose, some people might think it looks like rosemary. You know, it's kind of very uh, thin leaves. And that's Frankenia. That's what it looks like a little closer. Uh, then another one I want you to know is Sueda. So Sueda is, uh, so this, this is, so again, it's a, it's a stem, and then we have these leaves coming off the stem. Um, this guy's getting ready to flower. Battis. It's that one I told you that sends out those long runners. Um, uh, so pretty much Sueda mostly looks like this. Frankenia mostly looks like this. Salicornia mostly looks like this. Uh, Battis can look quite different depending on the environmental conditions. So check it out. It's, it's like this. It's doing its deal. When it gets a lot of a lot of water, it plumps up almost circular. The, the leaves, whereas when it's low um, low water, the leaves are more triangle like. So Battis can look different. Um, Here's it in flower. Here's, here's a, this guy's just starting to flower. So we have these little teeny flowers. And again, here's that spreading morphology of it. So that's baddest. And if you look at this, it looks like you can see these lines here. So it looks really, you know, edgy. Leaves have edges. But again, when it's in a really wet area, it'll go almost circular. Or excuse me, not circular, but cylindrical, the leaves. Baddest and Sueda, at first glance, might be a little hard to tell apart. 
Or, or, or sorry, sorry, Battis and Jaumea, I should say. So Jaumea has similar leaves to the so somewhat similar leaves to uh, Battis, but a very different morpho overall morphology. When it's in flower, it has these big <coughs> yellow flowers. Hmm? Is that one also called a faulty seasoning? Mm. I haven't heard it, maybe. I don't know. Let's look it up after. Uh, I've not heard that common name. Maybe. Uh, Jaumea. Uh, so here is, this, this is growing in some flat, so it's a monoculture. You don't typically see it like that. This is, this is what it looks more like in the field. Um, and and it, again, this, the leaves are typically flatter. Okay, some of the more distinctive, relatively easy to know, upper marsh plants. So this is Limonium. This is that one I was mentioning that people have a, a different species in their garden that you can go down to the store and buy. Um, uh, it, so this is it. So you'll see it like this during most of the year. It'll, it, well, only when it's flowering will you see it. You know, only the spring, summer will you see it like this. So what we're seeing here is all these stems, all, the, all these inflorescences have come up, and it has this white purple flower that it sets, sometimes even bluish flower, and uh, and then it'll it'll that stem will die back. Here's again we were talking about this, but here's the daughter. Here's that cuscuta, that parasite, and it's covering I don't know what that is, a jaumea maybe I can't tell on the right. On the left it's it's over pickle pickleweed. But it can be really bright tangerine orange when it's really fresh and really dense. And again, we know that is an important disturbance factor. Yeah. Do uh, plants have a defense against that, or no. does it just kind of blend? Does is what it does. In theory, it can it can grow on any plant, but most plants it's really hard. To, so it really prefers the succulent ones. So it's going to definitely prefer, or. You know, prefer is a hard, the, the plant isn't thinking, but it, it, it'll do best on salicornia, uh, jaumea, those things that have more of a fleshy tissue. Things like the frankinia that's, that's much more thinner, and like the rosemary, they, it does grow on that, but they don't, don't do as well. It doesn't, doesn't get as much sustenance, so it doesn't get as abundant and doesn't get these huge killing. So this is the density at which it'll start killing the plants. That's really the place where it'll open up the canopy. <clears throat> but we can see what's going on right here is this guy's innocuous. So right we have this monoculture, and then the daughter came in, and now, you know, I don't know, six months from now or whatever it is, there's going to be these openings, right? So they're creating this disturbance. And the classic thing that you guys should think of when you think of disturbance in the upper marsh, where it's not super salty or whatever, is limonium. The only reason any limonium is ever in our salt marshes is because of disturbance. It is a crap competitor. It can't compete with anybody. It's got these little teeny thin you know, prostrate leaves gets overgrown by everything out there. And if it wasn't for this, this periodic disturbance of these monocultures and things, it wouldn't, totally wouldn't exist. Uh, what? There's more of the daughter. Okay. Uh, the salt grass, this is the one I said that's, that's our, our wetland champ. We have very few champs that do well elsewhere. This guy does well everywhere. So, um, it's one of those critters that deals with salt by, by pumping the salt outside of its body. So a lot of times when you look at the actual grass um, surface, it'll have like a crusty, white, powdery, crystalline covering. And that's the salt that's been excluded. Um, so salt grass um, grows really variety. So this is a really dense stand. It's just growing on top of each other, on top of itself. Here's an example where these runners have gone just subsurface. So it looks like here's a plant, here's a plant, here's a plant, here's a plant. It's actually one runner that's coming out from this mama plant and it's just going here. And then, and then the upward growing tissue is emerged from the surface of the soil. So to stickless. So what it looks like has this classic sort of grass shape of this, this alternating pattern of the ons coming out. Well, not ons, I guess, technically, but the, the leaves coming out. So it grows in a chevron pattern. Here's a big field of it. Uh, where is this? Oh, this is up at, this is at Ormond. 
So, uh, you know, this whole stand is, in this case, a monoculture in this area. I took this picture of uh, the cyclus. Um, Atroplex is another one, uh, another one of those ones I, I starred for you and said you guys should know about know what Atroplex looks like. So here's Atroplex. And uh, this particular one looks like, maybe it's lentiformis. It's a little hard to tell. But, um, but it has these uh, oftentimes uh, um, arrowhead-shaped leaves, triangular leaves oftentimes. This, this, this is not a great example of that. But um, this is more shrub-like. So this, this, is, this is a shrub-like shrub growth, but also has uh, woody stems, right? And these guys can be tall. So you can get them the size of your knee, but we can get individuals that are over the top of your head, right? So these, and depending on the site, depending on the conditions, it can be a large shrub. And there's multiple species. Again, we have uh, several native, but also several non-native species. For purposes of this class, you just have to know what atroplex looks like. And here's an example of one that's a, a not very tall yet, uh, growing next to, what is that? Some ice plant and some other things. Um, and so this is the atroplex, this sort of light green, right, light green plant I'm showing you. Okay, some animals I'd like you guys to know. We typically use taxonomic organization for animals, but in practice, in, in restoration salt marsh stuff, we typically talk about um, guilds of critters. So how, how things, what things eat or how things make a living. So, I'd see, so most typically we talk about the flying critters, like the birds, but they also include bats, but typically we're thinking about birds here. The, the swimmers, so nekton would be our fish, things that can move where they want to, by and large, whenever they want to, versus plankton, which are critters that pretty much have most of their movement dictated by the flowing of the water. So these are small things, typically single-celled organisms. Then we have things that walk on the surface or live on the surface. So if they're an animal, we might call them a walker. If they're um, a plant, we we call it epigeal, meaning leave it, live on the top of the soil. Uh, and then critters that live in the soil. So they, they could live on just the very top of the soil, that would be epifauna, or they could live inside, and we typically talk about the infauna. And then there are critters that live inside other animals, and those are parasites. We've talked about them a little bit already. So again, I'll give you this list, but um, these are just some representative things. I would just, a couple, to st make sure you star in your notes as examples. <clears throat> so we have the light-footed clapper rail would be one. That's an endangered species here in Southern California and it's received an inordinate amount of attention in terms of restorations with the goal of restorations trying to create better uh, bird habitat. Um, another one I'll just highlight that I like you guys to highlight is this guy right here, our Belding Savannah Sparrow. So this is a critter that is a state listed species, hugely problematic huge pain in my butt. These guys nest, reproduce in the spring summertime. When do we typically have time to go out and monitor stuff? When is biomass maximum in the salt marsh? Spring summertime. So a lot of times we can't do the monitoring we want because we have these, these restrictions because we don't want to possibly disturb some of these birds. So Belding Savannah Sparrow. And then of course we have things like, you can talk about a heron, like a great blue heron, classic wetland bird. In terms of the fish, we could, I'd say the most important one you should uh, star would be Tidewater Goby, another endangered species. Pretty much only lives here in our part of the world. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of restoration has gone on to try to make more Goby habitat. Uh, then we have the mud suckers. Another important one would be the, the California killifish. But the genus Fundulus is common throughout all of our salt marshes all around the world. So this is a little teeny, looks like a little, you might call it a minnow looking fish, little teeny, you know, about the size of my finger or so. 
Um, small, super abundant, everybody eats them, right? Every bird will love to eat those guys. And so really important uh, player. In terms of the invertebrates, we've already talked about Cerathidia, the horn snail, the one that, that harbors the castrating parasites. Um, let's see, who else would I flag for you guys? Um, so I'd say probably the tiger beetle. It's an, uh, one that uh, has some members that are endangered, but several others that aren't, but nevertheless is an important, important player. And then uh, in general, the polychaetes, the worms. <clears throat> And then our two crabs that look grossly very similar to each other. These are little small crabs, you know, the size of your, of your, the width of, you know, two of your thumbs, typically, something like that, or even just one thumb. These are pachygrapsis and hemigrapsis, very important players in our coastal salt marshes. Okay. And again, I want to, take a step back and just because we're listing species and all this and that, don't ever get caught in the trap of saying, we're just going to add these species and be done with it. What we're really trying to do is restore an ecosystem, not just a bunch of preserve a bunch of museum pieces that people are going to stare at and say how pretty they are. Right? So we really want to preserve the interaction. So this is from a mural up in a museum. My son used to like to go to when he was really little, um, up where we used to live up in the Bay area. And, um, and people see this, and a lot of people like were freaked out. But, oh, my poor rabbit, poor rabbit. <laughs> uh, my family has a lot of rabbits, and we do a lot of stuff with rabbits. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, my wife probably doesn't like this picture, but, <laughs> but I do. Um, and I think it's a nice sort of summation of what we're trying to have, right? We're trying to have a full interaction. And sometimes that means some of the organisms we put into our restoration are going to eat or kill the other organisms, right? That's part of what we're trying to restore. A healthy system will be such that we still have rabbits in there, even if we have some hawks doing the predation. But very often I see people doing these re this restoration planning, like we're gonna add this in, and then we're gonna add that in, right? As if, as if we're in complete control. Really what we're doing is we're setting up the conditions by adding these members of this community. And then we want that community to evolve on its own. It's gonna go someplace. And we want it to go to a, a place that is well-functioning and has all these species interactions. We don't wanna prevent things. And where you most typically see this is where we have things like endangered species. So we're putting some endangered species. No, gotta kill, I gotta shoot all these other predators. Like, wait, what? Yeah, well, you know, the whole point is to make more rabbits. That's not the whole point. The whole point is to make a healthy, viable population of rabbits so that when, when they do get predated, they can, they can do their, you know, the, we still have rabbits in the marsh and the hawks still have food. So when we take the abiotic and the biotic and the ecological interactions, they come together to produce these healthy, dynamic, Ecosystem. So in this case, we're looking at Morro Bay from a, a bluff. We're looking, uh, what is this, southward, I guess. And check that out. Look at all those really cool um, uh, back channels, all those tidal creeks. Really sinuous. Uh, there's all kinds of great stuff going on in there. That's what we're trying to recover. And so we definitely need to know our organisms because they're a key part of that. But we really want to go beyond just having organisms. We want the abiotic and the organisms and the relationships of those things going on simultaneously. That's how we're gonna get our restorations going. So then in summary, we talked about a little bit of community ecology. We talked about what we talked about zonation, succession. Um, we talked about disturbance a lot. We talked about some brief different regions of the marsh, either successional over, over time through succession or just over space. We might have at one time. We talked about organisms, we talked about some of the adaptations these organisms have to live, especially the plants, to live in these, er in these stressful areas. And we talked about, uh, ran through some initial examples of some of the mostly plants that you guys should know. Is that cool? Questions? <laughs>